cool. Good morning, Darren. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I know it's uh, it's quite early for some standards of of, uh, of Dubai, but I really appreciate your time. And I came across your profile on LinkedIn where I was quite engaged by your blurb about yourself. You said, "You feel? do you feel frustrated and confused as to why some of your team are rocking it every day and making your job enjoyable and fulfilling, yet others are not performing despite having the same objective and motivation from you? Now, I know you're coming from a radio background and, you know, uh, um, these days we're probably uh, speaking at the camera and at the laptop and maybe this is a great point to have you on my show. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Tricia. Good morning and thank you for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure and an honour. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned the, the radio background and whatever I've been doing in my, my whole career, I've always weaved in the radio aspect. And there has never been a time, I think, more prominent than now to really bring that to the surface and get everyone to recognise that actually this is a skill that we could all master and we certainly need to master it. When I've worked with people, you know, on a one-to-one, face-to-face scenario going into the company and almost shadowing the leaders to see how they're showing up with their teams, that's one thing because you can see all of the body language, you can see all of those non-verbal cues. But when you don't have any of that to rely on and you're purely working through electronic devices, there's so much of that communication missing from from the message, you know, and and that's what I really sort of thrive on in helping leaders now to dig down and, and understand what's going on on the other side of the camera. It's so true because we don't really technically have training on on uh, how to approach the digital world. And now we know some organizations are still working from home till now. And yet you know, the methodologies have not really been perhaps explored as to the best practice. Absolutely. And again, if you think about succession planning and, and the companies that really take ownership of succession planning, I, I pretty much, I guess, go out on a limb here, but I would pretty much guarantee that no company as part of their succession planning has actually factored in the the way in which leaders need to communicate to their teams through remote platforms such as Zoom or Microsoft Teams, WebEx, etc. That was never ever on the radar. Now, all of a sudden, we've had this situation thrust upon us and we're having to re- respond to that. And that re- response is not necessarily a response, it's more of a reaction. And we're now having to play catch up very, very fast. And the damage, and I use that word loosely, but the damage has been done because the gap that has been created from not effectively communicating with our teams remotely you know performance employee engagement is suffering hugely because people are not being motivated they're not being inspired and depending on their their personality preference you know do they prefer being with a group of people or do they prefer being working alone and depending on who we are in the working environment you know there's this mix going on all of the time but when we are thrust upon or into the situation where we have to work independently some people are really struggling and the leaders are also struggling with that situation they're not having the people around them so they don't have that executive presence that they had in a face-to-face environment and when they show up on a meeting there's there's no sort of structure there's no organizational protocol on how to conduct that meeting online and this is where I'm finding a lot of leaders that are struggling and if you think about mental health issues that will arise from this as well that anxiety is on the increase depression is on the increase because leaders just don't know where to go to get this support but it is there yeah absolutely and I think and maybe you could give some insights from from the leadership whether that's sea level or or under um and and maybe even we can touch on, I think everyone is a leader without the title. Um, you know, it's just it's just how you express the capabilities to do so. But being always connected and being always online and being in that digital space can actually sometimes hinder efficiency. I don't know if you have imp- or seen impact with that with your leadership discussions. 
I do, and I've got to put my hand up and say, I suffer with that myself. You know, I'm not as productive now as I have been in the past. And, you know, you might think, well, how does that show up then? Because you're, you're working with leaders to make them more productive. But I guess I've got the, the awareness of that. So when I start to recognize some of those signs of fatigue and that, you know, and, and getting to that, to that sort of virtual platform burnout, I, I recognize those and I get up and maybe I'll go for a run or I just go out and have a change of scenery. But most people, they're so dedicated to what they do in their work that they're there for X number of hours per day that they should be working. And those hours is not necessarily what we do you know, in the number of hours per day. It's what we do in, in each hour that counts. And if it's more productive in less hours per day, that's got to be more effective overall to the organization. Um, yeah, so you know, th th those those sort of indicators are things that we need to be aware of. And the leaders at the moment, I think, if you think about statistics, there, there was a, a survey conducted quite recently by Vistage, which is a peer-to-peer -peer coaching executive board. And they did the survey with CEOs and only 30% of CEOs are comfortable leading their teams remotely. And you think, well, that, that's quite scary to the extent that if these guys are at the top, you know, what does that say for the, the management, sort of the senior management, the middle management and, you know, the, the junior management? If, if the top guys can't get it, how do we stand? So I, I did another post yesterday, Tricia, and I was saying that this is literally from the top down. If you guys are not getting it, how do you expect the ones below you to be getting it? So this is an approach that I think needs to be embraced by many, many, if not every organization, that just because you're the CEO, it doesn't mean to say you have all of the answers. And just because you are the figurehead of the organization, you know, it doesn't mean to say that you cannot show your vulnerability. It doesn't have to be to the rest of the troops in the organization. You know, showing that vulnerability can be actually reaching out to somebody like myself or somebody that can offer similar services that can help you get from where you are to where you need to be, which is showing up with some you know, authority in that space of working online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really great advice. I think the higher up the ladder that you go, the less likely um, you actively show that maybe you are vulnerable. I think a lot of leaders, you know, always have that persona that everything is fine. I've got this under control, but perhaps actually they don't, but then actually can hinder those below them. So I think that's uh, a really good point. Uh, absolutely. And again, I think w where we are in this region, I think, you know, the, the, the culture might come into this as well. And, you know, when if we show up to our our sort of workforce that we don't have all of the answers, you know, that shows a, a chink in our armor. That shows that we have a weakness. And in reality, showing that vulnerability is by far, you know, a weakness. It's, it's actually a strength. You know, showing that actually, I don't have all of the answers. I need to surround myself with the people that do have the answers and help me make this work. And one of my, I guess, my biggest inspiring people in the world is Richard Branson and you know Richard Branson if you if you're not familiar with Richard Branson I would urge anyone to go and google him and, and look at his backstory but Richard Branson you know, he's got an amazing story you know what a, what a fantastic entrepreneur he is but he by his own admission says that he what he's achieved in his life is not down to what he knows what he has achieved is down to him surrounding himself with the people that can get the job done and you know I think that's an amazing you know things to take forward if we if we show up and n almost put our hands up and say look i don't know the answers here and in this remote working situation i don't have all of the answers none of us do but i'm sure there are answers out there that we can get some support in you know making it work and and come together so we do have the answers and then we can all then gel moving forward so what do you think would be maybe some advice or how can those leaders who are managing people who, people who aren't maybe as motivated or as high performing or as uh, visionary as what perhaps themselves or other like-minded colleagues are, how can you engage those employees? Because, you know, you're not in the office interacting, you can't read body language. It's very difficult. Quite often cameras are switched off. You know, they're only sort of um, uh, turned on for... Um, you know, at request or at the catch up meetings? Great question, Tricia. And, and again, I think this is where we have to take ownership. And, you know, we're, we're in a place where 
people who are working from their homes are also feeling vulnerable you know um, some people have you know what bigger spaces some people are in shared spaces some people are people are in confined spaces so that also plays a part in you know then either wanting to switch their camera on or not and I think it's up to the leader to create a space of you know comfort and calm and safety and you know, whatever's going on in the background nobody will be judged you know this is where we are all at and I think it needs to have some sort of structure some sort of almost a, a set of guidelines that we all work towards so we're all on the same page and wh why should one person be confident and be willing to have their camera on and, and commit 100 percent and another person is feeling fearful if i put my camera on you know what what's going on in my background might be you know used in some way to to judge me as I move towards progression within my career. You know, we need to create as leaders, we need to create that space of safety that whatever's going on in the background, it's okay. This is the situation, we just have to embrace it. You will not be judged based on what is going on in the background. And I think leaders need to be quite courageous in trying to create this space and, you know, sort of nurture people into feeling that, that comfort in in that space because if if they're not comfortable in that space then you're not going to get a chance to see what's going on and if you think about communication models i i refer to the albert morabian model which uses the 738 and 55 uh, equation so seven percent of any communication of our messaging is is purely down to the words so if you are relying on somebody just having their camera off and just delivering something in response to what you might ask them you've only got 7% of the words to really sort of hear what's going on. And depending on how that person articulates those words that they're sharing with you, you have really no idea. It's no different to writing an email. It's how you bring those words to life. And that's where the 38% comes in, in terms of our tone of voice. You know, you might give more of an inflection on certain words to bring that word to life. And you'll see me using my hands a lot when I when I talk, you know, and this comes from more than 25 years of working on the radio where you can't see the person who's delivering that show or that, that message, you know, so you have to emphasize in certain words, you have to sort of use your gesturing to get that come to life. And that's where that 55% comes in the the nonverbal communication. So that's the most powerful and if that's missing we, we we're missing out on a huge part of that importance of that message as well and I think the leaders need to be courageous in encouraging that space of safety whereby they get to use the seven percent they get to obviously work in the 38 percent of the tone of voice and they get to see the most important part of that communication of that non-verbal communication in in that 55 percent body language because if i'm if i'm speaking to you i can see you nodding your head now i can see you gesturing with your eyes you're speaking to me without actually saying a word and i can see that you know with a smile on your face i can see your eyes when your eyes light up i can see that certain things resonate with you if a leader hasn't got that how are they supposed to move forward now I also would suggest that they get to know their people at a deeper level. We all have these internal motivators that sort of trigger us and spark us into activity every single day. They're the things that get us out of bed in the morning. And unless as a leader, we know what they are within our team members and they'll all be different. There'll be a, a, a crossover for sure, but the main drivers will be different. So if we can understand what those main drivers are, you know, is it all about the money for some people? Is it more about helping others for other people? Is it about how I might be able to stand out and be, you know, independent and unique? Or is it more about being in, in control and having some sort of power? And, you know, depending on who the individual is, we as leaders need to recognize what those, those motivators are, what those drivers are. And when we then recognize those, we can then deliver our messaging around those those key drivers and that will show a connection that actually wow my, my boss really has something in common with me he knows me he gets me or she gets me and that is the the difference that makes the difference in connecting with people on a one-to-one -one and also then really motivating and inspiring them into action and i think that would really go a great way towards boosting employee engagement and performance at this moment in time yeah this is really great i think there's two points to to this that I would like to raise and out of the box thinking. So one, are the leaders doing it because they generally are interested in creating that connection with their staff 
or are they doing it to tick the box? Because I know that, you know, to be able to meet KPIs or to be seen as doing above and beyond, uh, there is a difference between generally wanting to know the person on the end of the camera or the, the, the team member, I should say, or booking a call and being still engaged on the camera off and clicking around and being on the laptop just to say you did it. Um, and second of all, I wanted to say is that it becomes burdensome. Burdensome, is that a word? It becomes a burden to... Uh, <sighs> To, uh, to the leaders, you know, quite often these guys are, um, are managing large scale teams and then to be connecting with them on an individual basis. Generally what happens is the person, the lower, you know, the, the lower person in the organization will be expressing negativity usually because they'll be frustrated with the way things are going. So then it becomes, you know, more on the leader's shoulders to handle. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. And you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I do see this a lot. And if you think about what, what might be the driving factor around that, and I think the, 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 the if we get down onto sort of the, the bare bones of it, it comes down to time, you know, do I have time to if I got a team of 10s of people, do I have the time to get to know them on an individual basis? But <sighs> It's almost like the compound effects, you know, if we take time to get to know people and we don't have to spend an hour on a call with this person, an hour on a call with that person. So if effectively, yes, we do have the time, but it's how creative we can be with that use of time and getting to know that that individual. And if we are, again, in terms of our communication skills, if we are actively listening to what is being said by those individuals, then those, some of those key indicators will be there. Some of those clues will be there. You think, oh, that's interesting, you know. Um, and I, I am, I'm convinced, Tricia, that we all have something in common. I don't know what that is, but I'm convinced we all have something in common. And if we listen actively enough to the information that is being shared, we can hone in on some of that information to create a synergy. And once we've got a synergy with somebody, there's a bond and we can build upon that bond. I, I know you come from Melbourne and I was, I was in Melbourne a couple of years ago and I, it was literally in and out one day and back out again. And we were delivering some communication skills training for you know, delivering messaging on camera. And one person in the group said to me, you know, I, I'm really struggling with building rapport with somebody. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, you know, I, I, I just struggle to strike up conversation. And I said, well, you know, we, we've got something in common with everyone. And he said, really, I, d I don't believe that. And I said, okay. I said, I can see just by what you're wearing today, you've got some like military um, cl clothing on. I said, are you ex-military? Oh yeah, absolutely. I said, there you go, you and I have something in common. He said, how's that then? I said, because I used to work with a company where we provided um, radio and television to the British forces all over the world. And you know, I've served here, here. Oh, I've served there. So immediately we've got something in common. Now, what are the chances of that? Going to Melbourne, meeting a complete stranger, and by the time that, that day's training finished, out of all of the participants, this particular man and myself, we had such a tight bond because not only did we have the bond of the military, but we also had the bond of serving in Kosovo at the same time. So that's really narrowing that down. And we were in Kosovo around about the same time. So I'm convinced that we all have something in common with each other. We just have to be prepared to work and find out what that connection is but we all have it yes yeah definitely true and i think sometimes you have to forget about titles and you know it doesn't mm. matter if you are you know uh, the janitor or the ceo you can still converse in a meaningful way and actually find out true yeah and sometimes this is forgotten especially on the digital space now because you usually only have the meetings with the, the same tier level or one below or above you know you you don't have that interaction anymore or as frequent. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask your opinions and advice and maybe experience on uh, decision making, because I know, uh, you know, the, the, the market is extremely saturated with, um, with information, with data, you know, there's left, right, and things coming left, right and center. So how does one or how should leaders be best making decisions? I think there's a, quite a few big decisions that need to be made over the, the coming months. And I think where, where companies are now in this remote working space and environment, and people are getting used to that. You know, we're, if you think about when the first lockdown kicked in a year ago or thereabouts, you know, all of a sudden behavior change 
has has been it's taken place people are very comfortable now with not having to drive to work not having to make their own way to work through public transport etc there will come a time where some organizations will need to return to the office and working environment those people that are quite comfortable and would really prefer to stay working remotely but their company is now going back into a, a requirement of being in a physical working environment that's going to take a big decision because that will create um, a situation where the person that makes that decision will be unpopular and that's going to take courage as well but i think essentially what we come down to in terms of decision making i, I narrow it down into three areas and this is based on the work that i've i've studied over a number of years and with psychometric assessments that i'm, I'm certified in using and one of them is the what we call an, an attributes index which is the work based on um you know well this, the science of value basically from dr robert s hartman and he, the three dimensions that he works with or worked with were sort of empathy practical thinking and systems judgment so are we looking about that sort of human connection so when we're making a decision is it driven through more empathy or is it more practical or, or is it more systematic is it more process driven and i think we all have the ability to evaluate equally when we are not under pressure now he talks hartman talks about sort of the the high velocity environment we are all in this up to 83 percent of our time even when we're working from home we are working under pressure because we've got things to be doing we're not we know we're not as effective and efficient as we would be back in the office so we've got all of these things that are mounting up and we've got these things to do so we'll be drawn to either more empathy more practical thinking or more systematic judgment when it comes to decision making and when we are under the pressure we'll go to a dominant voice in our head and it's either one of those three and i think depending on where the the leader is or the ceo at the moment in terms of their sort of loudest voice is it more empathetic is it more practicality is it more systematic you know this needs to be discussed and sort of assessed in terms of what needs to be the the, the, the driver for making that decision is it more systematic is it more practical or is it more empathy and i think there's going to be a, a combination of all three so the empathy side will come into understanding where people have their preference from working from home However, the practicality of the business requires them to be working back in that physical space. And I think that systematic approach will enable them to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I know I did mention this earlier, but it's not something that this is taught. I mean, you would really have to go out and seek a coach or proactively go and reach to someone to have these types of discussions. I think not many companies would be... Uh, and I say this lightly, but keen or interested to invest in this type of information and coaching um, because maybe they don't see it as, you know, a need or a benefit, but really it is. So I think, yeah, it's really vital. And I just want to ask one more point. And I've read a lot of information, some McKenzie and uh, some of the Forbes uh, articles. Uh, productivity has increased, but perhaps efficiency or efficacy or, uh, uh, yeah, efficiency has not it isn't, doesn't correlate. So productivity might have, but actually, you know, maybe numbers aren't coming or actually um, the, the real fundamentals is not increasing at the same rate. Do you have any insights? Uh, yeah, I, and I think that comes down to, if you, if you think about, you know, over the last year, we've, we've got to a point where, you know, a lot of organizations have had to restructure. So that means laying t members of their teams off. And with that, that comes, you know, with a price because the if if you know people are working in a team and some of their their team members have been laid off there for the ones that remain there's a sense of anxiety you know will i be the next to be asked to leave and and the ones that are still there and are not really anxious about whether they'll be next there's a sense of guilt because they're you know their good work colleague that has been there for a number of years is now no, no longer part of the team they feel guilty for being the ones that are left so that's driving a certain behavior in terms of their performance as well. And you're bringing new people together that really have not had prior experience or longevity in their experience of working together. So there are new ways of working, new ways of understanding. And with that comes new people issues that need to be dealt with. And again, I think the leaders 
are driving to get you know the work done get the work done get the work done but the quality so in terms of the efficiency that comes out of that yes they're getting the numbers ticked because they need to get the numbers ticked in terms of the productivity but the quality and the effectiveness of what is being done is lacking and i think that comes from you know going back to what we said earlier because it is really a, a full loop you know that motivation that inspiration why am I doing this? How transparent is the communication from the leader in terms of the, the organizational strategy right now? Where do I fit in this bigger picture? And I think that's what's driving that sort of that lack of effectiveness in, in what they're doing. It's not necessarily the, the volume of what they're doing, it's more of the quality. I think it's so important to go back to basics and just, you know, really fine tune, you know, make sure maybe even everyone does a SWOT analysis of themselves. So that then, you know, the leaders up, you know, above are shared this and then works out, okay, maybe we can resolve those weaknesses or partner you or pair you with someone where that's their strength. And then, you know, have a couple of hours together or somehow, you know, change has to occur for, for change to happen. Absolutely. You're absolutely bang on there, Tricia. And again, you know, it's finding the right talent. And I guess this is something you're experiencing right now, you know, where you're helping people to really identify the right talents out there. And a lot of interviewing. I, I worked with a client just on a very small project a couple of weeks ago. They recruited somebody and after six months, you know, they, they came and they said, this is a complete disaster. How could we get it so wrong? I said, but talk me through the process in, in which you went through to, to hire this person. And they did everything right. But it, it's quite a small senior team and they've been working together for a long, long time. And there are so many synergies going on within that team that, it's just gut feeling. When they recruited this other person, he came from abroad and he was interviewed remotely. And a lot of what, although he was on camera and on microphone, a lot of what we've talked about in our conversation today, Trisha, was missing. And that's how they got it wrong. That's how they got it wrong because there was no, none of that connection, that none of that synergy building, none of that rapport building. It was just going on a hunch. Well, on paper, he looks good. And effectively, you know, he came across well on the interview. As soon as that person got into that role, they saw a very different person. <laughs> yeah, and I you must come across this a lot. Yeah. Oh, um, I think this is where uh, interpersonal skills is just, you know, so important. And, you know, you would fly someone over or you would have a, a coffee or, a, or take them for dinner. And this is, I think, where we're realizing that this uh, is actually an investment. So I think, you know, it's really important that we can continue this in some way, whether it's scheduling a coffee catch up over the call, even if it is going to mm -hmm. be digital. So yeah, um, I really want to maybe uh, get you to explain some of your services and maybe, you know, how could my audience reach out to you if, uh, if they were interested to take uh, you forward? Thank you, Trisha. Well, the, the three pillars of unique consulting really comes down to leadership, communication, and culture. So all of the things that we've talked about today, you know, that, that would be encompassed within the leadership. So in terms of leadership trainings, leadership development, coaching, working with executives on a one to one or going into organizations and working with their teams or, you know, just to, to get some team alignment to really go through and, and crunch some people data and have an understanding around that data, because without that data and let's face it, the world we live in today is just driven on data in every aspect. And we don't necessarily focus on the data of the most important assets within our organization, which are the people. So if we can have an understanding around that, you know, I, I can certainly help you with that and get some sense of understanding to really align where people are and where there might be gaps of understanding in how you might be able to motivate and inspire an individual. Um, so I do that in, in teams. I also do that with, with leaders as well. I work with them one to one. I, I would normally go into an organization and sort of shadow them and become part of the furniture over a given period of time where you really do observe what is going on. You're not necessarily saying, don't do that. You're, you're really looking and saying, okay, what was the intention there? What was the proposed outcome or preferred outcome? And what was the actual outcome? You know, And th then we start to look at the, the journey from where they were hoping to get to and what they re re got to. And that's, that's quite powerful because all of a sudden they've got somebody there in a, almost like a, a constant coaching and mentoring space that they can tap into and get some answers and get some clarity around where they, they need to go. The communication aspect, really I, I, I draw back on my radio career and this is something that 
it comes in, I think, more than ever now than it ever has been required before as part of my career outside of radio. You know, how we communicate with somebody when we can't see them and we're only relying on that, that voice. And you see so many examples where people are delivering a, uh, a message via a platform and it's, it's talking at a, a piece of electronic equipment. He's not talking to the people on the other side of the, the equipment. So that's where we break through as well. And culture, I mean, culture is a, uh, it's a big buzzword and it has been for a number of years. But when we talk about culture, we're talking about organizational culture, yes, but we're talking about cultural understanding. So if I come from the UK and you come from Australia, you know, we have something in common. We, not, not only do we speak the same language, but you know, in terms of our behavioral norms and behavioral patterns and you know how we sort of do things we will come under what is called the the anglo cluster so although we're separated by you know many many miles you know northern and southern hemisphere we have something in common which we can draw into and, and make a connection and once we start to understand what some of these cultural values and and clustering might enlighten us with we can have a deeper understanding of the people around us so i, I work quite deeply on that as well so those are the, th the three main pillars leadership communication and culture and I think with all three, you, you've really got the box ticked there. Amazing. Really, really great. Well, uh, I will put your email or your LinkedIn URL down below to people for, to reach you or what's best. Yeah, please. Um, I, I think the, the LinkedIn profile is pretty good because I've, I've got both the Unique Consulting and my own profile on there. Or you can go to uniqueconsulting.com. And Unique is spelled Y-O-U-N-I-Q-U-E because it's about you and your individual needs. Very good branding there. Well, Darren, I really appreciate uh, your chat this morning. Thank you so very much. You have been given, you have given some great insights. Uh, let's keep in touch and I look forward to engaging in your co up and coming content. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you again for the opportunity. I hope your, your viewers get immense value from it today and uh, happy to help wherever possible. Thank you again. Thank you.